Hey everyone, it is I, the working author, Stuart Warren here. It's time for a short but hopefully concise video where I would like to discuss the top five things that you can do to be a better writer. The first thing that you can do to be a better writer is to learn a new language. I feel that language is probably the most effective way to transfer a culture through information. I learned so much about Norway when I learned how to speak Norwegian that it really helped me ground my first book, Spirit of Orn, into a reality that I could really know and understand. There's lots of aspects about a language that can help convey certain ideas about a culture. Idiomatic language, for instance, is really fascinating. In, in Norwegian, there's a phrase that basically means, how are you doing today? Or what's up? You know, kind of thing. The phrase is, Vodan stor det which means literally, how does it stand with you? Which is interesting. I just think that's really fascinating. You don't really get that when you don't know another language. There's other languages like Spanish, uh, Italian, French. All, all these romantic languages have various verb conjugations and sentence structures and different things that communicate how people speak in, in a very practical way. Definitely, I would recommend learning another language to help you approach writing and from a different perspective, basically. The next thing that you can do to be a better writer is similar to the first thing, but number two is to travel. And when I say travel, obviously that might be limiting for certain people who may not have, you know, a couple thousand dollars to be able to hop on a plane and go to Europe or something like that. But it's more about the idea of going to a place that you've never been before, seeing the people, seeing how they conduct themselves, seeing new landscapes, experiencing new things in those landscapes. When you travel, it helps uproot you from this general repetitive knowledge that you have of your own surroundings and helps you see yourself not just as a person where maybe deep down your ego is, you know, always believing that the world is revolving around you, but to also see the world as hundreds, thousands, if not millions, billions of stories ongoing and occurring all around you. So I highly recommend traveling to help cultivate that sense of understanding that you are not alone. There are other people and they have their own stories out there as well. The third thing that you can do to be a better writer is to study a career. And this may not be a career that you are involved in. It might be a career that is something you've never done before or something that you know a close family member does, um, but you don't really understand it. The, the idea is that we spend most of our lives working. Most of our time just in general is just us doing whatever we're getting paid to do. And the benefit, I think, of learning a trade or learning how someone does a trade, especially one that you're not very familiar with, is that it helps build and ground whatever characters, settings, you know, professions that you may write about or revolve around. It, it makes it very, a very good practical well of knowledge that you can work off of. For instance, when I wrote Dynamic Zemp's Protocol, there was a certain part of the story that takes place in a wastewater treatment facility. And while I was already sort of familiar with wastewater treatment just because when I worked at Stone Brewing Company, there was a wastewater treatment facility in the building itself to help process all the wastewater that was produced during the brewing process. Even though I was already vaguely familiar with that, having a secondary source of information to see kind of how it's done on an industrial uh, level really helped, again, ground my character in a real world around real processes and, and things like that. This could be for anything. It could be garbage man. It could be a carpenter. It could be a 
you know, a theater director. It could be a high school teacher. You know, all, th there's a there's a joke that all of Stephen King's characters are all English teachers. And really, it's because he was an English teacher <laughs> and you write about what you know. So to help broaden that base of understanding of your characters and your stories and your settings, it's good to learn more. Write about things that you want to know about, you know, uh, a politician. Not all politicians are the same. Most of them are scumbags, but some of them are good people. So what does a politician do from eight to five? You know, learning these different things help us become more versatile writers, help us write about different subjects and make our stories just generally more varied in their approach. The fourth thing that you can do to make yourself a better writer is before you write, when you sit down at your desk, get out your pen and paper, typewriter, whatever you use, before you write, write about anything for 15 minutes. And when I say anything, I literally mean anything. So right now I'm standing in front of a Canon camera and I am sitting in a chair. I have a lighting rig on me. I have a microphone on my chest. I have a road, road cycle in my kitchen because <laughs> I haven't put it back in the overhead storage at my apartment yet. Um, there's green plants outside my window. There is a fence uh, surrounding our common area in the apartment complex I live in. You know, there's when I start talking about these things and formulating that in writing, it's a great warm up exercise to basically establish yourself in a place, in a setting, around people that you may or may not like. You know, it, it's a great way to kind of get those, those ideas flowing in your head. And the trick to this is that, say you write for 15 minutes before you write every day. One of the things that you'll get better at is writing on command which I've said before is probably your greatest asset when being a writer. And a lot of that's because when you force yourself to write on demand, what you're actually doing is you're getting around certain things like writer's block. The reality of it is, is that you're not gonna write your award-winning narrative, your great American novel in the first draft. Basically, you're going to write many drafts before you get to that final end product. So if you just force yourself to write on command, then what you're ultimately going to be able to accomplish is just getting that first draft done, getting that second draft done, you know, prepping yourself for that third, fourth draft where your story is finally finished. If you can get out the writing in whatever sessions that you allot yourself for your writing and you just get it out for the sake of getting it out, you can always come back and take that stilted, artificial, ho-hum language that you used for before when you were forcing yourself to write it, and then speckle in the parts that make it dynamic and fluid and lively and you know colorful. That's, that's a great way to approach it, is by getting it out, then basically going back to it in a second or third draft, but later. That has served me well so many times, and while everyone's writing experience is different, I highly recommend learning how to just write things. Just look at a wall, describe what you're looking at, write it out, and those, that muscle memory will begin to start just turning over in your head and, and yielding amazing dividends. The fifth and final thing that I would encourage all of you to do when you're writing is to eavesdrop. <laughs> yeah, there's no other way to say it, but even though this, there's a stigma attached to eavesdropping and it really isn't polite, the reality of it is is that some of my best ideas have come from me eavesdropping on people and listening to the way they talk or latching on to a particular idiom or mannerism that person has. Being able to internalize that and to observe that 
allows you to put that out onto your characters. One of my favorite lines that I ever picked up was when I was work when I when I was in line at a Trader Joe's, and there was an employee there coming in to buy groceries for the weekend while they were off their shift, and they were talking to the checker that they were familiar with and had worked with before. She gets like a a, a carton of orange juice and then a handle of vodka, puts them down on the scanner and says, "One's for my anxiety, and the other one's for my antioxidants." And I thought it was like a really great line. Another one that I thought of, that, that I heard of before was from a coworker at a juice bar that I worked at once, where she told me this story where she was telling a story to either her coworker or to myself, I, I forget, but she was telling this story about how she would, you know, cut open radishes and look at all the, the veins and, and the different, you know, internal goings ons inside these, you know, root vegetables. And she would say, ooh, it's like talking to aliens when you cut open that beet or radish. And I just thought that was such a really interesting way to look at it. And it was so charming um, of an idea. So there's a lot to gain around eavesdropping. And, and obviously you can respect these people's privacy. I wouldn't condone, you know, doxing someone via eavesdropping eavesdropping, obviously, but observing people in real life, seeing what they do, their facial expressions, their mannerisms, all those things help build real characters. Because obviously you can't physically sit down and try to write something that is true to life. It's just impossible. You'll never have enough pages to describe a simple environment such as my apartment, for instance. The whole picture is worth a thousand words kind of thing. But what you can do is you can appeal to your readers' subliminal knowledge of the world that they're familiar with. And you can reference certain mannerisms and, and body language. Something that your reader has no doubt seen before, you know, in their life, in, in their lives, basically. But because it's sort of sub subconsciously being referenced, they're allowed to fill in the details that you leave out. And, you, and if you get good, at, good enough at it, which you know, I, I hope I'm kind of approaching that level myself personally, if you're good enough at it, you can start steering readers towards a certain impression and, and a certain type of understanding of a certain character by leveraging certain types of mannerisms they may, that the reader may be familiar with or certain expressions or certain use of language. And you can build characters piggybacking off of that and make this very organic and interesting character out of it. And yeah, it's eavesdropping is a hell of a way to write. And um, as much as it sounds kind of like silly or like a bad piece of advice, you know, it does work. It, there's so much that you can get out of it. So anyways, short video today, but I just wanted to offer up that uh, bite-sized piece of information. And yeah, I'll talk to you guys later. Happy writing.